This conference will now be recorded. Hello students, this is Dr. Divya from K9 State. So this is our last class of 11th chapter. Biotechnology Principles and Processes, Part 5. So in this chapter, In part 1, 2, 3 and 4, we had discussed about several biotech biotechnological processes and principles behind it. And in the last class, we had learned about features required to do cloning into a vector. So to do cloning work in a vector, what and all features that required? Or what and all features? a vector should have. Hope you remember all those points. Origin of replication, selectable marker, then cloning sites, then vectors for cloning genes in plants and animals. So these are the features that are required to facilitate cloning into a vector. So to do cloning into a vector, to do the cloning work, These are the features. Origin of replication should be there. Selectable marker should be there. Cloning site, perfect cloning site should be there. Then vectors for cloning genes in plants and animals. For cloning, for, to do cloning work in plants and animals, we should have proper vectors. So origin of replication means that is a sequence. It is a sequence where that replication is starting. Origin of that replication work or the starting point of that replication work. That is a sequence. From that sequence only, that replication work is starting. So in that host cell, when any DNA is linked to this sequence, this particular sequence, where is the origin of replication to that? Any particular DNA sequence is linked, that piece of DNA, that will start to replicate. Okay, so that is the origin of replication. Origin of replication means the starting point of that replication. So from here, in this plasma vector, first one, you can see origin of replication they have marked here. That means from this point, the replication is starting. See, like this, replication work will start. Okay. Then, then we need a selectable marker. So mostly antibiotic resistant genes are used as selectable marker. Then we said an example equally in that ampicillin and tetracycline, they are used as a selectable marker. These antibiotics, ampicillin and tetracycline resistant genes, they are used as selectable marker. So selectable marker means that is helping for selection of recombinants. So you should link all this with a point. So origin of replication, that means they, they, the replication process is starting. Then selectable marker, that is helping for selection of recombinants. Selectable marker is used for the selection of recombinants. That is just to get an idea about each step. Then cloning site. There should be a perfect cloning site where this restriction uh, enzyme should go and make a cut and their sticky ends will be made and in that the foreign DNA is inserted. So for that purpose, exact cloning site should be there. Okay. Then vectors for cloning genes in plants and animals. So for example, we are saying cosmids, plasmid vectors, bacteriophages, vectors, all these are examples for vectors. So we should have perfect vectors for cloning plants, plant genes and animal genes for cloning such plant genes and animal genes or the gene of interest, we should have selected vectors. Okay, up to this we have learned, all these features and all we have learned. Then next comes 
PBR 322. Okay. So from this chapter, this is a very important question, PBR 322 or PBR 322. You have to learn about this vector. So PBR 322, that is a plasmid. Actually, PBR 322 or 322, that is a plasmid. And PBR 322, it is a cloning vector. Okay, that is E. coli cloning vector PBR 322. So in this, you are studying this as an example for learning the features which is helping to facilitate cloning. So what and all a cloning vector should have. So for that, along with the features, you are going to learn about PBR 322 while explaining about the vector, a cloning vector, what are all features that should have to facilitate cloning. While explaining all those points itself, I mentioned each and every point of PBR 322, but this you have to learn separately because this is a very important question from this chapter. You have to learn this. You have to learn to draw this figure. Then in this, you can see all the features which are required for a standard vector. Okay. See so here in the picture, you can see the origin of replication, ORI. This is the origin of replication, which is mentioned as ORI. Origin of replication. That means from that point, the replication is starting in PBR 322. From this point, the replication is starting. This first feature which we mentioned is origin of replication, right? So here in PBR 322, this is the origin of replication. From this point, the replication is starting. So for example, of course, you have to draw this diagram and you have to mention each one. You have to mark it. Then you have to mention the features. Okay. So PBR 322 DNA, that is a commonly used plasmid vector in E. coli. First you have to write, it is a common vector which is common plasmid vector in E. coli. Then second point, that is a double-stranded circle. Okay, double-stranded circle, double-stranded DNA in circular form. Then it is having 4,361 base pairs in length. Okay, this is important MCQ, no doubt. 4,361 base pairs in length. Okay, so it is having total number of base pairs in PBR 322, 4,361 base pairs. So it is a double-stranded circle and it is having 4,361 base pairs in length. Then PBR 322 that is having genes for resistance to ampicillin and tetracycline. What do you mean by that? We were saying about selectable marker, right? Here origin of replication, next feature what we said that is selectable marker. So in PBR 322, you have antibiotic resistant genes, ampicillin and tetracycline resistant genes. See here, AMPR, that means ampicillin resistant. This is how you will mark ampicillin resistance. Then tetracycline resistant, TTR, this is tetracycline resistant. So these are the selectable markers which is present in PBR 322, which are they? Ampicillin resistant gene and tetracycline resistant gene, which is used as selectable marker in PBR322. Next, next feature is, then we need to learn about the molecular weight, which I didn't mention in this PPT. So molecular weight is around 2.83 into 10 raised to 6 Daltons. These and all for need purpose, you will get all these questions. The number of base pairs, 4,361 4, base pairs in length. Then the molecular weight is 2.83 into 10 raised to 6 Daltons. Okay, this you will get for your board exam also, this question to explain about PBR 322. So first we need to tell it is a plasmid vector which is common in PBR 322, commonly used plasmid vector in E. coli. Then it is double-stranded circle. Second point from this itself, we can make out it is a double-stranded circle. Then it is having 4,361 base pairs. 
then tell about the molecular weight molecular weight is 2.83 into 10 raised to 6 daltons okay molecular weight then you are going to explain the features one by one here origin of replication this is the origin of replication mark from where the replication starts next you are going to tell about the selectable marker selectable marker which is present the ampicillin resistant gene and tetracycline resistant gene both are present in the vector pbr322 okay then here just now i said origin of replication that is mentioned as ori and that is the starting point of replication then you can see the restriction sites third point what we mentioned restriction sites okay origin of replication over selectable markers over next restriction sites so here you can see many restriction sites for pbr322 here barmh1 next hing d3 then cla1 eco r1 pbu1 pst1 and here down you can see pbu2 okay so here all these are restriction sites here this one more restriction site sal1 sal1 okay so all these are restriction sites you should not forget don't get confused so which are all the restriction sites for pbr322 barmh1 hind d3 sal sal the sal1 then pbu1 pst1 pbu2 then echo r1 this cla1 okay all these are restriction sites these are the restriction sites then another marking you can see in the figure that is rop what is rop repressor of primer short form of repressor of primer okay that is a repressor of primer see rop this is how it is functioning rop codes for protein involved in the replication of plasmid okay so what what work rop is doing here ori that is a original replication next is rop rop that is coding for protein which is involved in the replication of the plasmid so that protein is involved in the replication of plasmid plasmid replication that is helping in the plasmid replication one protein so this rop repressor of protein that is uh, helping or that is coding for the protein that particular protein which is involved in the replication of that plasmid then this protein that is controlling or that is regulating that is helping to regulate the copy number of pbr322 plasmid of e coli okay so rop rop that is repressor of repressor of primer so rop this is coding for the protein which is helping or which is involved in the replication of plasmid that is involved in the plasmid replication so that protein is coded by this rop then that protein is having another role what is the another second role of that protein that is involved in the regulation of copy number of pbr322 that is helping in the regulation of copy number copy number of pbr322 okay so let's explain the main characteristics of pbr322 first the origin of replication is there then second one second one is the selectable markers selectable markers are ampicillin resistant gene and tetracycline resistant gene which are uh, they are working as the selectable markers then next is restriction sites here you can see so many restriction sites in pbr322 they are pst1 pbu1 eco r1 cla1 hin d3 barm h1 then sal1 then pbu2 
these many restriction sites are there okay then you can see another one rop rop that is repressor of primer that is coding for the protein which is involved in the replication of that plasmid then that protein is helping to regulate the copy number of that pbr322 okay then here we said about different antibiotic resistant genes that is that is different antibiotic resistance genes act as a restriction site and there here you can see different antibiotic resistant genes here the tetracycline resistant one and ampicillin resistant one they are acting as a restriction site and for ligation of that foreign dna okay here restriction site here you can see bamh1 is there pvu pst1 is there pvu1 is there here Uh, both sides you can see the ampicillin resistant gene and tetracycline resistant gene by chance the restriction enzyme is coming and making a cut here and that a ligation of the foreign dna or the gene of interest it is happening in this side then that selection is easy so that is he helping to select the transformants then here when the gene that foreign gene yesterday we discussed in the previous class we discussed about the foreign gene or the gene of interest is inserting there means that site or that inserted site that become that becomes inactive okay some cases that that is becoming inactive so here tetracycline resistance which becoming inactive by chance here it is happening means it is getting inactivated okay so that kind of situations are also there so that gene will become inactive and it won't work so for that we are using some alternative method for selection so which is that alternative method which is used for selection suppose that gene due to the ligation that gene is getting inactivated or it is becoming inactive then what we will do for the selection of recombinants for that we are using another alternative method that is called as alternative selectable marker so what is that alternative selectable marker selectable marker we know how we are going to select with the help of selectable marker see for the selection purpose some kind of markers we are using to select the recombinants so here when that method is not working we are using some alternative method so these methods they have the ability to produce some color after reacting with a chromogenic substance okay that yesterday we said that is producing some kind of enzyme enzyme substrate complex is forming it is forming some color okay so here they have the ability to produce some color after reacting with a chromogenic substance here for example gene coding for beta galactosidase okay so that alternative marker they are used for the eas of differentiating recombinants from non recombinants okay so due uh, with the help of this alternative selectable marker with the help of this method actually they are forming when they are reacting with a chromogenic substance they are making or they are producing some kind of colors so it is easy to identify or it is easy to differentiate recombinants from the non recombinants by using this method see when a foreign gene it is inserted between the gene coding for beta galactosidase then the recombinant cells do not produce or they does not produce enzyme beta galactosidase okay in that restriction site we are saying about the restriction site in that site any antibiotic antibiotic resistant gene is there and at that site we are inserting the gene which is coding for beta galactosidase okay so that time that cells or those those genes will become inactive so the recombinant Cells they cannot produce the enzyme beta galactosidase. Okay, so 
So here the foreign gene is inserted between gene coding for beta galactosidase. That foreign gene, some foreign gene is inserted between gene, the gene which is coding for beta galactosidase. Then the beta galactosidase producing gene that will become inactive. Okay, and that won't produce the enzyme beta galactosidase due to what? And that gene is getting inactivated. It won't get produced. Beta galactosidase won't get produced. It will become inactive. So in the presence of chromogenic substance, non-recombinants form blue color. When that chromogenic substance which we are using, in the presence of that chromogenic substrate, that non-recombinants will form blue color. Okay. And recombinants will form colorless colonies. This in the last class we had discussed about the uh, this procedure, how we are using this method. So how we can differentiate chromogenic. The, uh, when we are using this chromogenic substrate, non-recombinants, non-recombinants will form blue color colonies. Okay, with the help of this substrate, it is forming blue color colonies and recombinants recombinants what they will do recombinants will form colorless colonies there won't be any color colored colonies in the case of recombinants okay so that foreign gene which is inserted between the gene coding for beta galactosidase then the recombinant cells won't produce the enzyme beta galactosidase why due to inactivation of that gene. That gene will get inactivated, so that won't produce enzyme beta galactosidase. Okay. So when that enzyme is not there, because a new gene is inserted and it, that got inactivated, when that enzyme is not getting produced, the enzyme won't react with this chromogenic substrate and there won't be any color formation. So recombinants won't form any colored colonies. But in the other case, in the case of non-recombinants, there that enzyme will get produced. Beta galactosidase enzyme will produce because the gene is not inserted in between that. So beta galactosidase producing gene will work, that enzyme will form, and that enzyme will work with the chromogenic substrate and enzyme substrate complex when it is forming it will form blue colored colonies so that we can differentiate with the help of alternative selectable marker. Okay. Next is for transformation with recombinant DNA, how to make a competent host. Competent host for the transformation with recombinant DNA. So we know that DNA is a hydrophilic molecule. Then it cannot pass through cell membrane. DNA is hydrophilic, we know that. And that is not passing through the cell membrane. It is not able to pass through the cell membrane. So how this bacteria will take up the plasmid? See, the vector, vector that bacteria should take, no? Then only it will work. Right, it should get transferred. That foreign DNA should get transferred. So the uh, how to force this bacteria to take that plasmid? So that bacteria cell first, we need to make the bacterial cell competent. Then only it will take the DNA. So first, the host cell should be competent. The bacterial cell, see this vector we are inserting into a host cell or into bacterial cell. So that plasmid, that plasmid vector, how a bacteria will take up? For that, we need to make that bacterial cell or the host cell should be competent to take or to accept this DNA. So how we, how we can do this? We can do this by treating them with a divalent cation. Okay, this is done with the help of a divalent cation. We can treat the host cell with a divalent cation, a specific divalent cation. In a uh, correct concentration, we can do, like, for example, we can say that calcium. This calcium that increases the 
efficiency okay efficiency of that dna which is entering into the bacterium how because in cell wall you can see pores okay which is through the pores of the cell wall in cell wall so many pores will be there so through these pores dna will enter inside the bacterium so that capacity or the efficiency of that entering of that dna that can be increased with the help of divalent cation like calcium okay that should be prepared that should be treated in a specific concentration then after treating with the divalent cation that will increase the efficiency of entering of the dna into the cell through the pores of cell wall so this recombinant dna like this we can force the recombinant dna into cells okay what we will do that cells by incubating the cells with recombinant dna on ice first what they will do recombinant dna can then be forced into first treatment with divalent cation then recombinant dna we can force into cells by incubating the cells with recombinant dna on ice then after that after treating we will keep the recombinant dna and the cells first keeping them on ice this after treating with divalent cation incubating the cells with along with recombinant dna on ice okay after after this step next step is placing them on 42 degree centigrade heat shock that work first placing them on ice then suddenly after that placing them on 42 degree centigrade after that placing from there first ice then placing the at 42 degree centigrade and again putting them back on ice okay so this work this we need to continue this this is enabling this is to enable that bacteria for the take up of or after this that recombinant dna will be taken inside that bacterial cell okay so first what we need to do we need to do this treatment with divalent cation so that through the pores of the cell wall that recombinant dna that uh, or the dna can enter inside the cell then that recombinant dna we can keep along with the cell along with the cell we can keep on ice then it is followed by placing them at 42 degree centigrade and again we'll put them back on ice so like this continuously doing is that is that is helping that bacteria to take up the recombinant dna okay so that's how we are making the cell competent host okay then that is one way of doing a competent host then another way another way there is so many other ways to introduce this foreign dna or this gene of interest into a host cell and in that you can see micro injection method then gene gun method all these are methods to introduce the gene of interest into a host cell these are different methods to introduce the alien dna or the foreign dna into a host cell so in this method in micro injection method you can see that the dna here this is the micro injection method in micro injection method this is the needle with the foreign dna and this is the cytoplasm this is nucleus to that nucleus of the cell where the genetic material is present to that this foreign dna is injected okay so what they will do in this method micro injection that recombinant dna which is directly injected into the nucleus of animal cell micro injection method mainly we are using in animal cell so that micro injection needle with foreign dna or the recombinant dna 
that is directly injected into the nucleus and it is mainly done in animal cell in the nucleus we are directly injecting to the nucleus of the cell and it is mainly done in animal cell then for plants which is a suitable method that is biolistics or gene gun method gene gun method or otherwise it is called as biolistics okay in gene gun method that is suitable for plants gene gun method the cells here you can see the target plant cell to this we need to introduce that foreign dna so here gene gun barrel gene gun barrel is here and here you can see the plastic disc with dna coated gold particles here you can see that dna gold particles will be there small particles will be there gold particles and that is coated with dna okay so what we will do in this cells are bombarded with high velocity micro particles of gold or tungsten okay gold or tungsten micro particles will be there and this these particles gold or tungsten particles will be coated with dna that dna of interest and that method is called as gene gun method we are in introducing the gene of interest by using the same method of a gun okay this is otherwise called as biolistics or gene gun method in that what we are do doing it is mainly used in plants and in this in high velocity with high velocity this micro particles micro particles small very very minute particles which are coated with dna uh, dna recombinant dna or the gene of interest this uh, which gene of interest or the alien dna with that this gold or tungsten particles are coated so that one is bombarded with high velocity this it is bombarded with the cells with high velocity and in that pressure this micro particle which is coated with the gene of interest that will go inside the cell okay so that all all particles won't reach inside the cell some will be successful so here you can see the dna which is coated with golden particle that with high velocity when that gun barrel is hitting on this plate this micro particles will go in a very high velocity and that will go inside the cell inside the target plant cell got it and here another method now we have learned about micro injection method which is mainly for animal cell then gene gun method particularly for plant cell and the last method is disamped pathogen disamped pathogen vectors disamped pathogen vectors these are mainly what to do with this these are to infect the cell and to transfer the recombinant dna into the host cell okay like agrobacterium tumefaciens and all for that purpose we are using that is having actually agrobacterium tumefaciens that is a pathogen which is infecting plants some kind of plants so for that the pathogenic effect is reduced or that is that's why we are saying disarmed pathogens that pathogenic effect is disarmed or that effect is reduced and in the same way one pathogen is infecting how a pathogen is infecting a plant in the same way that with that pathogen that is used as a vector to transfer the dna or the gene of interest in the same way that will get infected but here the dna transferring is occurring instead of the pathogenic effect that dna is getting transferred the foreign dna is getting transferred into that host cell so the last method used is disarmed pathogen vector which is in this method it is allowed to infect the cell and transfer the recombinant dna into that host cell okay so micro injection which is mainly for animal cell then gene gun method or biolistics that is for plant cell then disarmed pathogen that is 
that is the third method which is used for transferring the recombinant dna into host cell and the pathogenic effect is reduced or that is disarmed and how a pathogen is getting infected how a pathogen or a, how a cell is getting infected in the same way this pathogen is infecting the cell or the organism and through that to the, this disarmed pathogen is working only as a vector to transfer the foreign dna into the host cell okay next is recombinant dna technology it is having several steps first we need to isolate dna okay first step is which are the steps of uh, our dna technology first isolation of dna these are the process of different processes are there in recombinant dna technology different steps are there in that process so first first step is dna isolation then fragmentation of dna by restriction endonuclease first we need to isolate the dna see we have an idea in this plant or in this animal we need a gene which is having a specific advanced character okay see the particular some it is resistant to some kind of disease or it is producing some kind of compound so that gene we want and we want to produce it in higher quantity or that product we need in higher quantity so we need to transfer that gene to another one so for that purpose what we will do first we will isolate the dna the whole dna we will isolate then fragmentation of dna by restriction endonuclease restriction endonuclease only can cut the dna so with the help of restriction endonuclease we are making fragments of that dna which is isolated then isolation of a desired dna fragment see in this whole dna we don't want we need a particular point or the fragment of dna where our gene of interest is there where our alien dna or the desired gene or the gene of interest is there only that fragment we need so only that fragment we need to isolate okay then after that we need to ligate this dna fragment into a vector because we need this to be transferred to another host cell so how we will transfer the gene of interest is present in one fragment only that fragment we will take out we will isolate that fragment which is having our desired gene then we need to ligate or we need to join this dna fragment which is having the desired gene to a vector the ligation of this dna fragment with the vector okay vector is just like a vehicle which is helping to move this gene gene of interest into the host organism so transferring the after ligation of the dna fragment with the vector transferring the recombinant dna into the host okay so ligation of dna with vector now recombinant dna is ready then we need to transfer for the recombinant dna into host now no combination of dna is ready there that should be transferred into host cell okay then it's transferred to host cell next is culturing the host cell in a medium at large scale we need the product of that desired gene in higher quantity so what we will do for that we need to culture that host cell already transferred that vector into the host cell or the recombinant dna into host cell then next step is to culture this recombinant dna or the cul culturing this host cell which is having the recombinant dna in large scale okay after large scale uh, cultivation or uh, culturing what we need to do extraction of that desired pro product in large scale that product forming gene also will be there so after that we need to extract that desired product the desired product that gene will produce the desired product so we need to extract that from that large scale production so we done all the steps isolation of dna then fragmentation of dna by with the help of restriction endonuclease then after the so many fragments will be there from that isolation of fragment of dna which is having desired gene 
then ligation of the DNA fragment into a vector. We need to ligate the DNA fragment into a vector, then transferring of recombinant DNA into host. After ligation, that recombinant DNA should be transferred into a host, then culturing the host cell in a medium at large scale. The host cell which is having the desired DNA or the recombinant DNA that should be cultured in at large scale. Then from the large scale, we need to extract the desired product, which product we want or for what purpose we cultured in large scale, that product should be extracted. Okay, so these are the steps, steps involved in recombinant DNA technology. Next is, Isolation of genetic material. We said about isolation of genetic material. First, we need to isolate the genetic material which is having our gene of interest. So, how we will isolate the genetic material or DNA or RNA, whichever may be the genetic material. So, you know that nucleic acid. Nucleic acid is the genetic material for all organisms. Okay, nucleic acid. That may be deoxyribonucleic acid or ribonucleic acid, water may be, nucleic acid is the genetic material. Then, in majority of organism, what you can see, DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is the genetic material. Mainly, DNA is the genetic material in major, major group of organisms, you can see DNA is the genetic material. And, for cutting this DNA, what we will use? Restriction enzyme. Okay. Why we are cutting? Because we need that pure DNA, which is not along with the other molecules. In a cell, you know that so many other molecules will be present, right? So, without all those disturbance, we need only the DNA. We have to take out the DNA only. So, there is DNA is enclosed in a membrane. First, we have to open the cell, right? If you are opening the cell, then only the DNA will come out. DNA, only DNA we can't take out first. So, all other molecules will be there, which is RNA, protein, polysaccharide, lipids, all those will be there inside the cell. Cell structure you have learned, right? So, DNA will be, genetic material will be present inside the nucleus. So, first we need to break the cell. Then along with the DNA, you can see all other molecules like RNA will be there, protein will be there, polysaccharide will be there, lipid will be there. So all these we need to avoid and we need to take out only the pure form of DNA. Okay. So how we can do this? This can be achieved by Treating the bacterial cells, plant cells or animal tissue with enzymes. Enzymes like lysozyme, cellulase and chitinase. So how we can treat lysozyme, cellulase and chitinase? By treating all these in particular bacterial cell, plant cell or animal cell. If you are treating with these enzymes. We can get the pure form. See here you can see different stages. First, what we will do, suppose we are isolating the plant DNA. See, in mortar and pestle, we will grind the DNA. Uh, sorry, grind the leaf. We need to collect the leaf or the tissue from where we are extracting the DNA that we need to grind. So this directly we, we won't be grinding with the help of some buffer. Some kind of buffer we will add. Then, how to make this powder? With the help of liquid nitrogen, frozen liquid, this DNA sam uh, samples or the leaf samples will be collected and kept in liquid nitrogen. And this, with the help of liquid nitrogen, will grind this. will be freezing and this storing in lower temperature, all these samples to isolate the DNA. So from there, we will take out and with the help of liquid nitrogen, we will make it into fine powder. Then with the help of buffer, we will make it as a mix like this. Then we will add different buffers, comp other DNA extracting compounds and all. Then with the help of centrifugation technique, mainly we are using centrifugation. See this and all, after centrifugation, you can see here it will, here sediments will be there and the super supernatant here, 
the transparent one, the supernatant, that liquid we will collect and the next reagent we will add. Like that, we need to add everything finally with the help of ethanol. After three, four steps with different reagents, we will add ethanol to that. That ethanol will precipitate the DNA. So final precipitation is done with the help of ethanol. Okay. So genes, they are located on long molecule of DNA. You know that genes are present on DNA, right? And that intertwine with proteins such as histones. So DNA along with histones, it will be present. So DNA it is present inside. So we need to inside the cell. First we need to break the cell. Then step by step we need to remove. So RNA removal that is with the help of ribonuclease. Protein removal. We said RNA will be there. RNA how we will remove with the help of ribonuclease. Ribonuclease enzyme. Treatment with ribonuclease enzyme. Then protein can be removed with the help of protease enzyme. In different steps. That supernatant will be collected. Then after that, this ribonuclease enzyme to remove the RNA. Then protease enzyme will help in the removal of protein. Then finally, that purified DNA. Here you can see. Protein removal will be there. DNA precipitation will be there. You can see from the starting. Sample preparation. First grinding. Then cell lysis. That is breaking of cell. Then protein removal. How to remove protein? With the help of protease enzyme. Then DNA precipitation. How you will precipitate DNA? With the help of ethanol. So ultimately precipitating with the help of chilled ethanol. We need to add chilled ethanol at specific quantity into that. Into this epidoc tube and that will precipitate DNA. Here you can see in this picture you can see the precipitated DNA. So before adding, before adding this chilled ethanol, it will be like this. The supernatant will be collected and kept, and that will be like this. So when you are adding, double the volume. Double the volume if you are adding the chilled ethanol, you will get like white thread, fine thread-like structure. You will get that is after adding ethanol, the DNA will be in pure white form like threads it will be there then now you got the dna whole dna you separated out now you need to cut the dna with the help of what you are cutting with the help of restriction enzyme so restriction digestion is next step and that is done with the help of incubating dna with restriction enzyme Okay, at specific temperature or at specific conditions, you need to incubate the DNA with this enzyme. Then agarose gel electrophoresis that we have already learned the process of agarose gel electrophoresis, which is for the restriction digestion. That step restriction enzyme digestion that is done with the help of agarose gel electrophoresis. And here what you are doing, the negatively charged DNA molecule, it is moving towards the positive side. In a buffer will be there. In that agarose gel will be prepared, DNA will be loaded and when you are applying electric field, the DNA which is loaded at the negative side, negatively charged end and the DNA is also negatively charged. So due to that repulsion, negative negative repulsion, the DNA will move towards the positive electrode which is called as anode. So that process, the same process, it is repeated with vector also. Okay, then Joining the DNA involves several processes. After having this DNA which is cut, that vector DNA, we need to, there also we need to make a cut. Then after cutting the sticky ends, with the help of that sticky end, that gene of interest will be inserted to that vector and ligation, ligation of that DNA, uh, gene of interest, DNA with gene, gene of interest with the vector will be there and that is forming the recombinant DNA, right? These steps we have already learned. The next is 
amplification we need that recombinant dna in more numbers or the copy number should be more so for that we are using pcr pcr is polymerase chain reaction that is called as polymerase chain reaction pcr is nothing but it is just for the amplification that is the polymerase chain reaction so in this reaction you will get so many copies of g the gene of interest will get multiplied you need uh, you will get more, many copies of the gene and it is synthesized in vitro using two sets of primer okay so for pcr mainly you are using two sets of primers see there are different types of primer single primer is also there two types two sets of forward primer and reverse primer is there then you can see rapd primers ssr markers all these things you can see okay so the enzyme that you don't no need to learn now different types of primers and all in 12th standard you don't have to in higher classes you can learn about different types of primers so pcr mainly you are using buffer again you are using that enzyme that extends the primer using the nucleotide which is provided in the reaction in reaction you will get dntp you will get buffer you will get dntp means nucleotides that they are the nucleotides okay so the enzyme multiple copies of genes you are making with the help of two sets of primers and the enzyme which is the enzyme dna polymerase this is helping in the polymerization of the making more copies polymerization of dna is happening with the help of the enzyme dna polymerase and two sets of primers then that enzyme that enzyme dna polymerase that is extending the primers we said about two sets of primers that with the help of dna polymerase that it is extending the primers using nucleotides we are providing nucleotides dntps in that datp dttps dgtps so that is called as dntp dntp generally we are called as atp gtp all those things we are providing okay so enzyme nucleotides we are generally calling this nucleotide they are forming the sequences so for extending the primer we need to provide the sequences then only that will get added to that extension okay so in that reaction genomic dna will work as a template okay this genomic dna will work as a template and the another strand will get synthesized with the help of this primer and dntp so if the process of replication of that dna is repeating many times that segment of dna which we have added which we need to get amplified or the foreign dna that also you will get so many copies billions or millions of copies you will get so that repeated amplification that is with the use of thermostable dna polymerase this is occurring in high temperature 92 degree centigrade you are getting the reaction and all 92 degree it will go to 92 degree and primer temperature we can set in a pcr machine so there are different steps so temperature may go high low high low it will sometimes it will, for some reaction it will go in higher way and for primer we need to set the temperature at which temperature it is working or the multiplication step is happening so according to that this will go to higher temperature also okay so there should be a thermostable enzyme which is helping for this work so that thermostable dna polymerase that is isolated from the bacterium thermus aquaticus so the repeated amplification is done with the help of thermostable enzyme that is thermostable dna polymerase and that is isolated from this dna uh, thermostable dna polymerase is isolated from thermus aquaticus and this will remain active during the high temperature high temperature induced denaturation of double stranded dna the double stranded dna is double stranded we know that and that double stranded dna will become single stranded that is the denatured it will that hydrogen bonds will get break and the double stranded dna will become sim, single stranded 
and for each single strand another strand will be synthesized okay with the help of this enzyme and the dna polymerase enzyme with the help of dnt tps the matching sequence will be added and again each strand will work as a template strand and another strand will be synthesized okay so which is that enzyme dna thermostable dna polymerase which is remaining active during the high temperature reaction also high temperature denaturation process also so the double stranded dna will get split into single stranded one or during denaturation and each strand will work as a template strand so the amplified fragment after this the amplified fragment that can be ligated with the vector for cloning purpose okay for again cloning purpose we can use the strand amplified strand and here there are several methods of introducing this ligated dna into recipient cell into that recipient recipient cell we have several method different methods are there to introduce the cell or the dna into that recipient cell so after making them first we are making them uh, competent with the help of this divalent method cation method and all so to receive and to take the dna which is present in the surrounding we are making them to accept the dna which is present in the surrounding so the recombinant dna that is having the gene of resistance antibiotic resistant gene when it is transferred to e coli cells then that cells that cells will become ampicillin resistant cells because that is having the gene of interest which is having the ampicillin resistant right if you are spreading these transformed cells or the recombinant cells on agar plate which is having ampicillin then only the transformants or the recombinants which is having the ampicillin resistant gene can grow in that other cells will die or other cells will become inactive because ampicillin resistant gene is present in the transformants and only those will be able to grow others will die so it is able to select so it is easy to select the transformed ones because the present that plating method in that ampicillin is there so only ampicillin resistant one which are having the ampicillin resistant gene can grow and that can perform other other genes or other cells will die so the ampicillin resistant gene here we can call it as a selectable marker okay then how to obtain the gene product how to obtain that product see when you are inserting a piece of this foreign dna into a cloning vector then we are transferring that to a bacterial cell or plant cell or whatever it may be to a host cell and then it is getting multiplied okay so what is the final aim that recombinant technology by using that recombinant technology our aim is to product uh, produce a protein or a final product okay so to get that product that recombinant dna should work or that recomb whichever combination new combination we made that should work or that should get expressed so the foreign d foreign gene that will get expressed under some conditions so this expression of foreign gene in that host cell that that is having so many technical details that we will say uh, recombinant gene expression for that different steps are there so after cloning that gene of interest that that will grow under specific conditions optimal conditions will be there then only that ex, that will get expressed and the target protein will get expressed and we need to first set or we need to understand the condition at which that recombinant dna is getting expressed and it is forming the product product of our interest the gene will produce the interest product of interest or which were product for what purpose we are growing or we are doing that recombination that product we need to get and at certain conditions only it will get expressed and the protein will get produced so 
after studying all these things only we can go for large scale production so any protein which is encoding gene that is expressed in a heterologous host which is called as recombinant so like this while after studying we can go for a small scale production in the lab then the cultures we are using whichever we have used by using that we can extract that desired protein and then we can purify it by using different techniques okay in small scale production then that cells we can go for continuous culturing then we can add to fresh medium see while doing the large scale production what we can do we can do this continuous culture then from one side it should be in a medium the culturing should be in a medium so one from one side after the complete growth that medium can be removed and fresh medium along with the culture can be added from other for what for maintaining the culture so the growth stage most active stage that exponential phase or the log phase so that phase and all we need to study and we need to maintain the cells in the physiologically most active stage that is the exponential stage so this type of culturing methods that we can do in large scale production for what then if you are doing large scale production we will get large scale protein protein we can produce in large scale the product we will get in large scale so the small volume culture that won't give maximum amount of product the desired amount of product won't get from a small scale production so for that we have to go for larger production so uh, how we can produce in large quantities for that we need bio reactors where only in bio reactors we can go for uh, 100 to 10000 liters so that much volume we can use we can culture and we can go for the product in bio reactors so bio reactors that is the vessels in which raw materials are biologically converted into specific products individual enzyme etc by using microbial plant animal or human cells okay we can use microbial or plant animal or human cells we can use and with the help of this bio reactors they are the vessels in that vessels by using the raw materials we can convert biologically we can convert the cultures into specific products or individual enzymes by using microbial plant animal or human cells okay so under optimal conditions like at correct temperature there will be a specific temperature at which this culture or this recombinant dna will work and at specific ph then substrate should be proper salt vitamin oxygen all these levels should be in the optimum condition then only this will work okay at specific conditions only this will work see if the the temperature it is at 60 degree only this will work means only at that temperature you will get the maximum yield or maximum product okay that's what i am saying so the bio reactor will be having specific conditions to give the optimum product optimum level of product so here how to obtain the foreign gene product here you can see a stirred tank reactor is usually cylindrical this is stirred tank bio reactor that is usually cylindrical with a curved base why we are using this curved base for the mixing mixing of the contents then the stirring that stirrer that makes the oxygen availability throughout the bio reactor this is a stirrer that is making the oxygen availability everywhere this moment so alternatively air bubbles that also bubble through the reactor so oxygen availability should be proper air availability should be proper then after all these conditions only you will get the maximum product so the bio reactor 
that is having an agitator system an oxygen delivery system then form control system and temperature control system ph control system and sampling ports so that small volume of the culture can be withdrawn periodically so periodically that culture when it is in the maximum growth that should be removed and new culture should be added to that new medium plus culture should be added to that for production okay so water and all or bioreactor will be having agitator system oxygen delivery system then form control system temperature control system and ph control system then sampling ports will be there to remove the smaller volume of culture periodically okay then after completing this synthetic stage that product that product we need to make ready for marketing right after finishing we need to make it for marketing so for that we need to purify that product okay so the process that including separation first from that culture we need to separate it and purify it so this uh, separation and purification that is together called as downstream processing separation techniques we should know then purification technique also that is together called as downstream processing so the product has to be formulated with suitable preservatives then that product for bringing into market first that should be separated purified then it should be treated with preservatives to store then clinical trials should be done why we are doing clinical trials to make sure that it is not causing any harmful effect in the case of drugs and all we need to do clinical trials then strict quality control testing for each product we need to send it for quality checking so we should have uh, we should ensure the quality maximum quality to introduce that into market and we should go for clinical trials in the case of drugs so the down downstream processing and quality control testing vary from product to product for each product the quality test will be different and the purification separation and purification methods also will be different okay for food item it will be different for drugs it will be different so there will be separate methods for each one so that's all about downstream processing and all so hope all this principles and processes of biotechnology we have learned about different techniques everything is clear go through this portions if you have a doubt you can ask me in the next class hope everything is clear if you have any doubt you can ask me is it clear okay hope up to this everything is clear go through this and if you have any doubt you can ask me in the next class thank you